everyone. Can we hear me okay? Yeah, sure. It is very exciting to be here this morning. I very rarely get invited anywhere, let alone invited back somewhere. So it's my <laughs> I've made a success already of the day. So if we is this one I want. Great. So at Mintel, for now over 45 years, we have been dedicated to one core purpose, and that is quite simply this, helping people and businesses grow. Whether that is the largest giants in the world of financial services or FMCG, retailers, right through to the new brightest stars that are coming for tomorrow, the likes of so many of you in this room today, it's all about providing the insight that we believe you need to grow. Now, of course, the type of insight that is valuable is different depending on where one is at in one stage of development. For those big, big businesses, so often have huge audiences, they need to know about some of the micro changes in that audience, some of those very small adjustments in, in, in consumer behavior that will ultimately lead to big changes tomorrow. However, it's a bit different for you because actually you all know your customer extremely well. You have created your product, your business idea, all around a need, uh, a complete conviction in, in, in an opportunity that will lead to you knowing that customer. You know that customer because you know yourself and why you created this idea. But what about when you want to expand your business, when you want to go beyond that group that you know so well? And this is where market research has its first benefit. It's about knowing how to make that next step. Who is our next possible audience and how can I engage with them? And I guess the second core area I think that market research is inherently valuable to you, to anyone really, is for people who don't know you. What happens when you come to those, those dragon's den moments? Or devil's den, as I called it when I was practicing last night. When it comes to those dragon's den moments where you're trying to think, you know, how can I contextualize my product? How can I explain my offering? It's here where stats can help. It's here where our research can really reinforce your offering. For instance, if you've got a, a vegan cereal bar, you know, or oh, people are cutting back on meat, that means nothing. You can then reach to the research and show that actually, according to Mintel, I think it was a third of all adults have reduced their meat intake in the last year. It's this type of information that can really help your passion, your belief, your conviction to stand on its own two feet. And it's not a sales pitch for me, because I'm by no means a salesman. This is all available for free at British, British Library IP centres here in London and its network of libraries around the country. This opportunity to access some of this amazing information, if I do say so myself, all for free. Nothing's ever free, but this is. <laughs> My croissant was free this morning. So, <laughs> and it was delightful. So, <laughs> today I thought we'd go through some Intel research just to prove the breadth of information that we have available. And conveniently, I thought we'd go through some of my research. Each year for the last 30 years now, Mintel has published our flagship report, our British Lifestyles report. This is an amazing opportunity for us to pull together research from across all of our amazing analysts into one centralized spot, where we offer something of an update on what's happening in every consumer expenditure category. Food, food service, drink, non-alcoholic drinks, separated from alcoholic drinks, clever. All the way through to things like financial services and leisure. This is all pulled together so we can understand what's going on right now and what could happen tomorrow. Now, as the editor of this report, I get the joy of reading all the way through it, all 193 pages, and working out what are the cross-category trends that are coming through. And I have selected four for us to work through today. Life on the go, our second one, health and well-being, 2.0. Experience is all and consumer ethics. So, without further ado, let's begin. Consumers on the go. Now, I don't suppose you need me to tell you, anyone who's rushed here this morning, who's you know, thrown children around and fought with bus drivers, Life is getting rather busy, and we have a plethora of data to prove that point to us. 41% of all UK workforce, someone didn't listen to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was bullying. 41% <laughs> of the UK workforce is now travelling in excess of 30 minutes to and from work each day. 6% of us are travelling in excess of two hours each way each day. That is extraordinary. We are spending all of our time on the bus. This report found other real gems. 54% of us are now working outside of our contracted working hours. And some research that was finished just a few months ago, if we look at Generation X, that's our middle, middle age group, 39 to 53, 30% of them said they are struggling to find time to get adequate sleep. That's not great. They're the ones looking after children and making decisions. They really need some sleep. So from this perspective, we can see life is getting really, really fraught. So where's the first go-to here? Where is it really starting to impact? Well, the first problem is our diets are starting to take a hit. 21% of UK consumers say they lack the time to eat healthily. It's really tricky. When you are tired, when you are bored, or when you are stuck at work, you do not crave salad. Nobody craves salad. 
this is a lie. And yet, and yet the problem is that's like having a really disastrous impact on our waistlines. That's also bullying. So what's happening? <laughs> so what's happening is here is we're looking for other options. We are looking for our snacking habits to reinforce our health. And there's kind of three core groups that are coming out of this. We're first looking for natural years and years of slightly dodgy ingredients going into our foods, and suddenly we thought, oh, what is that BH112 that's in the back of my cereal? Never heard of that. We're kind of looking at the ingredients, wondering what's natural. We are viewing natural as a much more holistic, healthy prospect. Finally, nutritious. Secondly, nutritious. We're not getting those meals we need. We're not able to eat those three registered meals a day so easily. So those snacks really need to bring the nutritious punch. We need to be able to turn to our diet to get the nutrients we're missing out on. And third, customizable. We're all special. No one likes to feel like they're off the shelf anymore, which is fair. So we're looking to our diet for customizable options. I don't just need lower calories. I need gut health claims. That wasn't an admission. But, <laughs> but we need things that can work for us. And so we're looking for options that can be much be beyond just what everyone else is getting. These three coming together to create a really, really strong demand from the consumer. And finally, to gloss over the top of all of those, our desire for good tasting things. 38% of UK consumers describe themselves as foodie. Now, I'm a passionate believer in British cuisine and defending food in the UK. It is not just jellied eels. No one here in this room has probably had one. They are not a thing. But it's the thing globally, we're not thought of having good food taste. And yet over the last few years, we've seen a real delve into people loving taste, people wanting flavor, people wanting higher quality products. So it's all very well if it's nutritious, if it's convenient, if it's a great snack, but if it doesn't taste good, which so many of the healthy ones don't, people will reject it. So on top of all of this, you have to bring that proposition with a great taste. And then we look to the startup sector, surprise, surprise, and we see there's some genius things going on. Matcha now from a company called uh, Buddha Teas, bringing you high quality matcha tea. This is a really expensive high grade of green tea from Japan that has to be brewed basically Im immediately, otherwise it will lose its flavor as it gets uh, mixed with the water. So what they've got here is a on the go matcha tea product where when you release the cap, the matcha will be released into the water so you can have fresh uh, on the go matcha tea as you go. Soup on the go. I'm not gonna pretend that soup is a particularly new thing, but what they've got here is an on-the-go format of soup. That carton can be heated, reheated, and reheated over and over again without it damaging the flavor or the style of the bottle. It's also got all those nutritious claims we talked about there. Uh, roasted carrot and ginger soup here has got huge amounts of vitamins and nutrition, is, nutrients. This is a way of showing we can have health on the go. And thirdly, one of my favorites, this is kind of falls into the realms of uh, uh, a healthy snack that's still got a, a bit of fun to it. Holy Moly is from a startup from launched just a few years ago here in South London, a chap who had worked in the city, but realized every time there was a break in the office, he was turning to cookies uh, and cakes because they are delicious. And he wanted a healthy alternative. So he went away with his wife and experimented and came out with Holy Moly. These are 100% natural, high in fiber, low in calorie, five, five grams of plant protein. They're good for bodybuilders. They're good for yoga fanatics. They are delicious. Do go and try one. And it's not just food. Of course, we're running out of time. We've got less time to eat, but we've got less time to do everything. So we're looking for shortcuts in our, in our personal care regimes too. And we see from the very biggest brands to the smallest, really clever innovation. From the likes of Thierry Mugler and Yves Saint Laurent, they've got these now uh, paint-on fragrances you can use. So you never need to spritz me in the eye on the tube again. <laughs> it happened, I squealed. Man, <laughs> man cave, this is actually quite... <laughs> I did. It hurt. This is quite a big brand, man, uh, man Cave. Now, micellar water is something that's existed in the female personal care market for several years, or well, years and years now. It's nothing especially new. But let's repackage it. Let's take it. Let's talk to a busy man who wants a personal care regime that can work for him on the go. And all of a sudden, we've got this really, really lovely, beautiful product proposition. A no-rinse formula. fits in a travel size bottle. Add the marketing that shows it goes in a gym bag. And yes, we've reinforced stereotypes, but we've also got a great product for micellar water for men. And finally, FitKit. This is a really lovely product from a startup, uh, a 2015 startup. Uh, now, this is this is just it's a shower gel. It's nothing too too complicated, but it offers fantastic post-exercise functional benefits. Helps muscles recover, etc. And the bottle is designed so it doesn't leak in your bag. Now, that might seem really obvious, but I promise you, all the others will leak in your bag. As someone who throws a gym bag around all day, every day, this is what you want. And the clip to keep it so it doesn't get lost in your bag, even better. So beyond just the product benefits, we also see this desire for consumers on the go, this desire for greater convenience feeding through into our use of online services. And we see this in things like subscription. Now, subscription has really took off a few years ago in the realms of food. We saw things like uh, 
HelloFresh and some of those big recipe boxes starting to really make waves. Now, we start to see it move through into the personal care market, <coughs> nappies, baby food. These have been big areas of exploration for subscription culture. But it's finally moved its way through to uh, men's personal care. It took its time. Razor blades starting first. Now, this is the likes of... Um, this is Dollar Shave Club, a huge brand from the US. It's gradually made its growth. I think this on the go, this direct consumer approach is going to continue to get, gain weight in the coming years. People will like the fact they can get things to them rather than having to go into a shop and trundle around the, the, the lanes, finding things they do not need. And if you don't believe me, good slide. Unilever does, at least. They spent $1 billion on Dollar Shave Club in 2016. There is clearly a lot of weight behind this idea of gradual growth in this market. I think it's very important to see that this is a real opportunity, not just in the likes of uh, on-the-go se uh, product sales, but also in things like clothing. We've seen our analysts see the retail clothing market has zoomed in recent years, up 8.6% in 2018 to an estimated £19 billion pounds of online clothing sales. That is extraordinary, and we anticipate this growth to continue over the coming years, albeit it will start to slow off ever so slightly in about three to five years' time. Go to the report for the reason for that one, I can't remember. So what's next? Well, I think on the go is going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to be a bigger thing as we look for faster solutions to our ever faster life. There is an argument that, in fact, some people might also want a product that stops speed, something that gives people a reason to stop and slow down their lives. But ultimately, we're going to look for solutions that can help us optimize every aspect of our lives. And if our product sits in two categories, it should do two things. It either helps us speed up or it helps us slow down. But when you look at your proposition, think about where it sits in those categories. So. We talked a little bit about health and well-being, and I think that's our next big trend. Now, if I were to say, you know, health and well-being, by the way, it's a really big trend, I think it'd be fair for the British Library to probably fire me on the spot, get rid of Mintel contracts, and say, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for my language, but it's true. The reality is, is that health and wellness has been a big trend for a number of years now, and it continues to grow. But the development of this trend that's so fascinating is how our understanding of health and well-being continues to grow, and what that means for this industry at large. So let's start on some familiar ground. Let's start with sugar, for instance. It's an issue we're all aware of. In fact, the stats prove it. This is some global data here that I thought we'd show to show just how broad our concern about sugar is. In the US, 87% of US consumers are limiting the amount of sugar in their diet to some extent. Possibly necessary. 55% of <laughs> 55, that was so unkind. 55% of Canadian consumers agree a healthy diet should be low in sugar. And in the UK, 34% of us are looking for a health snack. If it's going to be a health snack, it has to be low in sugar for us in the UK. So we've seen the big brands kind of react to this. We've seen the likes of Heinz here with its uh, no added sugar product, really trying to cut the amount of sugar in their product. But you might know what's coming. It's the startups who I truly feel are answering this question in a really exciting, innovative way. We've got two examples here of many. We've got uh, Vive. This is a uh, protein water, which in itself is pretty innovative. They are looking at using sucralose to give the sweetness to their drink rather than adding sugar or using any types of traditional sugars. It's a very sweet product. They are definitely working the sucralose. True, now this gets another shout out later. This is a fantastic product, a granola product that's using functional fibers. In this case, it's using uh, inulin from a chicory-derived chicory inulin. So not only is it able to use lower sugar claims, but is also able to use the EFSA-approved gut health claims that allow this product to have extra benefits. It's not only taking away, but it's adding to. Another area we're all being encouraged to cut down, alcohol. Surprise, surprise, Britain has a poor reputation for alcohol consumption. We're drinking too much. Not me. <laughs> 40, so we're listening as well. 47% of UK alcohol drinkers and buyers say that in the last uh, three, three months to November 2018, they cut their alcohol consumption. And in fact, it's not published yet, but the most recent data shows that's continued to rise. We are all aware of this need to cut back on how much we're drinking. This is nice to see. This is actually imitated across Europe in our data. And again, startups, amazing products to rattle through here. But Tonique, this is a stunning wine replacement product that's in this most beautiful packaging that shows how you don't have to have wine with every meal for it still to be sophisticated. Strike, a gorgeous product, not gin it's called, they have a not rum variant. The most gorgeous packaging, and in fact, this brand has come out of nowhere and was purchased by AG Bar earlier in the summer. So impressed were they by its offering. And thirdly, uh, Everleaf, a smaller, still developing brand, only launched in the summer, I had the pleasure of going to its launch event. 
This is an aperitif that brings together so many beautiful botanicals to create a really sophisticated product offering. These are saying you don't need to be Coca-Cola, you don't need to be Pepsi. Fanta is not the only other alternative to a beer. You can have so many more sophisticated options that can make every meal a special occasion without getting drunk in the corner as a side study. <laughs> so, we've cut the sugar, we've cut the alcohol. I could continue talking about cutting, gluten, dairy, meat, it just goes on. So what exactly are people eating? I mean, you know, no one's sitting there living on dust, are they? <laughs> We're actually looking for our diets for things to give back. We need things from our diet. We are aware that our diet can feed back to us in so many ways. And the data shows this beautifully. Look, we are looking to our diets for our healthy heart, to healthy weight, to boost my energy levels, or most interestingly to me, to boost my brain function, maintain healthy brain function. You see, I've started already, health and well-being for so many years has been about diet. In fact, worse than that, health and well-being has been about losing weight. That one simple line that, of course, is so disengaging to the consumer. Our entire life's mission, which for thousands of years has been about procreation, is now about being thin, apparently. And so what's encouraging is we've seen this kicked. We're moving away, we're developing, and suddenly it's not just about being thin. Our health is broader. It's about our mental health, our emotional well-being. We have a much more advanced understanding of health, and it's so encouraging. 77% of Brits, it's as important to look after your mental well-being as your physical health. Great, we're on to one. But of course, it still comes back to our diets. Remember, we're looking to our diets, 44% of us, to help with brain health, to help maintain our cognitive abilities. And we're seeing some really exciting startups play into this space. Not as many as you'd think, but some. This is a brand called uh, Neuro that has launched a uh, flapjack. It's very good. That it uses CBD and nootropics as a way of sh showing that you can have cognitive benefits. There are so many EFSA approved uh, brain health claims around things like B6, B5, B12. They are being underused from a cognitive health perspective. <laughs> Huge opportunities remain here. And finally for this section, sleep. We come back to the start of the presentation. All those people not getting enough sleep. This is becoming part of our understanding of health. We get it. We're not getting enough sleep. My six hours last night is why I'm slightly jittery this morning. <laughs> 81% of consumers agree that getting enough sleep is as important as following a healthy lifestyle. For our products, it's now about showing how health is a much broader proposition. How do our offerings, whether it's a service or a new food product, how does it play into our daily lives, the ecosystem of every day that we live through? Is it helping us to get the energy we need? Is it helping our brains to work their best? Or is it helping us with the rest we need? Where does it sit on that day-to-day -day lifestyle? So I think what's next? Health and well-being, our understanding of it will continue to grow and develop. And as brands, businesses, we need to be ahead of the consumer. We constantly, with our proposition for your offering, need to show that we understand how health is developing and make sure we're part of the next stage. It's not just being behind. At this point, we can't just offer a weight loss bar, thankfully, anymore. We need to show that we understand where consumer health is going. And I really believe the market research that's offered by Mintel can help us to do that. So. We started with two trends that are really quite heavily based around products. So it's interesting to see some of the bigger services and sort of lifestyle trends we also see. And the third of my trends today is experience is all. That consumer demand for an exciting experience. And we can see it lived out everywhere. 33% of beauty and personal care shoppers are more likely to buy something on impulse if they're in an exciting store. And perhaps the most telling of all, we know about those damn millennials. <laughs> of which I am one, 72% of millennials say they would rather spend money on experiences than possessions. We are in an experience economy. We don't have room for any more stuff in our tiny, tiny homes. There is no money either, so we may as well enjoy the experiences. And we can see this lived out in our data beautifully. 11.7% growth in the music concerts and festivals uh, market last year. And that excludes the proms. This is just like Glastonbury and things. It's even bigger, I promise you. 6.7% growth in 10-pin bowling. Who thought that died out in the early 90s? <laughs> I contributed to this. I went bowling for the first time two weeks ago in Finsbury Park, and um, it was great. They're actually quite heavy. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I wasn't great. Um, <laughs> But this is fantastic. This shows people are living their lives out in a much broader, more exciting way. Let's hope they're putting their phones down at the same time, albeit I took 109 photos of me bowling. <laughs> and back to that health and well-being trend we saw just before this. People are living for health and well-being. And do you know why exercise is more popular? It's not like exercise got, you know, 
easier. It's good it got more fun. We're finding better ways of making the exercise and fitness market more exciting. It has become an experience. And it, as digital capabilities get better, we are offering more exciting exercise all the time. Suddenly, exercise is no longer just running around the park, although that's quite fun. It's also about getting really immersive experiences. 44% of current and potential gym users would be interested in virtual reality classes. In Germany, there is a startup with a headset for fitness that allows you to train next to former Olympians. I can't help but feeling that would be very disincentivizing if you lose every single day. You know, you're just setting off on your run, they've already finished. That's, but you know, you might be excellent runners, I would lose. Um, and we can see this lived out in stores. This is the Puma store, a really great store that launched just a few weeks ago in London, an immersive experience that shows how exercise can be part of different types of experience. I said just now that health is no longer just about getting fit, it's about our mental and cognitive well-being. Well, what Puma are doing is they're offering different zones in their store. You can go to a relaxation zone, a yoga zone. We should go, Susan. Um, <laughs> they're offering a, a meditation zone, all of these offered around the store so that you can get a different experience depending on your needs at that point, and it's all linked back to fitness. So I realize we're all startups. None of us have Puma, Puma's budget. I'm not saying that to make your brand succeed, you need to go out and spend probably several million pounds in a store in London and fill it with meditation capsules. Not at all. What I'm saying is that we are looking for experiences in so many parts of our day. If I said we're looking for... Uh, you know, speed or, or slow down in different parts of our day. We're also looking for experience. And it's about showing how your product fits that bill. Whether it's a huge outlandish experience, like you, some of you might be proposing Zorbing at the top of the Millennium Dome, I don't know. But even if it's a cooking product, one of my favorite examples of this trend lived out is a new startup called Rusi or Ruchi. I, I don't actually know how to pronounce it. It's a Sri Lankan table sauce brand. Utterly delicious. This is a wonderful proposition. And what's being offered here is an educational experience. When you read the pack, you learn about the product. You learn about Sri Lankan culture. You learn about the founding of that product. It's all in there, this wonderful experience. And it's about three minutes long of you reading, of you cooking with it, smelling the, the, the flavors of the, of the cooked food. It's a wonderful experience, and it's as simple as a cooking sauce. Similarly, we've got this. It's a brand called Herbivore. It's quite premium, offering amethyst-based uh, beauty products and amethyst rollers. Now, this is nothing particularly striking here. It's an amethyst roller. It's very pretty. I don't know if I believe in its skincare benefits. That's not for here. What it does offer is that moment each day, it ritualizes beauty and personal care. You are taking time out for you to gradually massage your face. It's a huge experience for about 90 seconds. But that 90 seconds that makes that busy day is complete bliss, I promise you. And finally, if you get the film reference, you get prizes from me later. Prizes are just I love you. 73% um, of all adults say that poor customer service is one of the leading factors that would cause them to not trust a brand or business. Customer service is the most important experience we can offer. And it is why so many startups are achieving at this moment in time. Why? Because you know your customer. You understand your customer in a way that so many big, big businesses are struggling to do. You understand them because you created your product with a need. You created your service around that need. And understanding that means you have an immediate affinity with that customer. Cherish that relationship. Nurture that relationship. Because that customer service offering you can pose is what's different for you. It's what has that connection, that amazing relationship that we need with our customers in this busy, busy world. And these huge giants, Facebook, but Unilever, they're amazing companies, but they are going after that personal relationship. They want what you have. So enjoy it and nourish it. It is the most important part of your startup. So what's next? I think in an era where price is so important, we're all obsessed with price. If Mintel runs a question, says what's the most important fact when you buy Lou Roll, price is the first thing that comes back. So go beyond that. Nourish the experience. Tell people what you're offering. How are you enriching their lives beyond just saving them a 60p, because you've all got something special. You can go beyond that. So our fourth and final trend for me today, and then I will leave you alone, ethical environmental. Now, I have oodles of stats globally that can tell you about the importance of being ethical environmental. But I think, you know, one quick look at the news to see the huge effort from Extinction Rebellion tells you just how concerned people are about the environment and the huge, huge issue it causes. In fact, 47% of UK adults identify plastic pollution as a key environmental concern for them. Animal welfare, in fact, right behind that at 46%. And climate change, I think, was about 42%, our Ethical Lifestyles report found. People are really worried about the planet, which is a good thing because, you know, <laughs> it's not looking too good. So... We said, I said it was cross-category, I said people are worrying about the environment in different categories. What I wanted to get to the bottom of in my research is where most, where are we most likely to make ethical, ethically uh, in reported decisions? So I asked, quite simply, when you are shopping, which of the following categories are you most likely to consider how ethical a brand or business is? 
So no one really likes an interactive uh, presentation anyway, but do have a think to yourself, which of these do you think? Think quite hard, I'll give you a second. Which of these do you think people are most likely to think about how ethical a brand or business is before buying? I know the answer. Um, <laughs> it's beauty and personal care in first place. I heard some right people. But I also heard some people who thought the same as me. I heard some people who thought food and drink. That was my, that was my idea. When I wrote this question, I fully expected food and drink at top, partly because I had asked this question before, <laughs> and food and drink was at the top. And I wanted to see how things had changed. So this is how the full data transpires, and it's fascinating. You can see right up top there, by quite a good margin, 47% versus 44. Beauty and personal care taking the lead. Food at 44%. Food service, clothing, household care. Now, irrespective of what's where, actually this table tells us immediately a really interesting story. The top five responses, plus clothing kind of, are all part of FMCG goods. They're all things we buy relatively frequently. They are things that we are hugely familiar with. Why? Because we shop all the time. Our retailers will tell us we shop more and more often. We are familiar with the retail landscape. We know where they are in the shop. We know the brands. We know the price. So when we go into a store, we have that extra time, that millisecond of time to think, did this brand kill an animal for me to use this? Oh, they did. Let's probably choose another one. Did this, you know, do they support fur manufacturing? Oh, they do, probably won't buy it. We have that time snap to make that decision, that informed decision. When we move to the second half, travel, technology, automotive, furniture, we don't buy these that often. I don't think, you might buy cars all the time, I do not. We don't buy these products that often, and so when we come to make a decision, it's a much bigger thing. These are big ticket purchases. We have to think through so many things. How expensive is it? What color is it? Do I like it? All of these aspects that come to mind, and suddenly, ethicality drops down. My point here, as I made in the report and I will make to you today, is that the world, the planet, is struggling a little. It is an important aspect we need to be cautious of. And just because consumers aren't considering ethics and environment when they make decisions in your category doesn't mean they shouldn't. And you know, one of my favorites is when brands say, I'm gonna push aside all your extra concerns. You should be thinking about this today. Bulldog, the men's skincare brand, is my favorite example of this because for years we've had two categories of marketing beauty and personal care products by gender. Women get the spiel. You know what you're doing, women. We're going to tell you all about the color, how it feels on you. We'll throw in some sexual stereotypes to go with boot. We'll make you feel special and then not special. Men, however, have just been made to feel stupid. This is shave gel. You put it on your face, you shave. <laughs> so boring. So what I like about Bulldog is they're saying, You've got this. You know how to use a razor. If you don't, you'll find out. What we're offering is a really ethical product. It uses bamboo handles. It is, can be recycled. The packaging is from your sugar, uh, sugar cane uh, card. This is a product you should be using because it's ethical. They have sidestepped the issue of how you can use the product, what color it is, its price point, and they are engaging with men in a market that has been treated so, so stupidly for years and saying, this is an ethical issue. Listen to us. Bulldog sales are going through the roof. This is possible. This can be mapped out in those other categories. You just need to be bold about it. So, sticking on food before we get to beauty, why is it that food brands, you know, food brands are doing a great job from an ethical perspective? We have three great startups here. Letterbox Wine from Garcon Wines. I love this. This is a flat wine bottle that can be posted through your letterbox. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in plastic, that devil plastic. But why is this better? Glass is heavy. Glass comes in huge weights. Those big boxes of wine that I struggle to carry through my door every week, they're very heavy. So what's the benefit of the plastic? It's lighter. It has a lower carbon footprint. This is a more ethical decision. But that brand's having a hard time explaining to consumers plastic isn't always the enemy. Plastic is often the enemy, however, in bottled water. As we've decided to be fit and healthy in the last few years, we've increased our water consumption radically. Great for sales of bottled water. Bad for the use of plastic going into those bottles. So we've got the likes of can of water coming along here. A fantastic product, really chic, with this wonderful black can that can actually be resealed. It's convenient too. Do you see my presentation is cyclical? And finally, True, another shout out for True. I do not now, nor will I ever work for True, but this is fantastic. Their packaging is stunning. It's a premium product. It's got all those health credentials. And finally, it's in compostable packaging. And you know, it's a paper bag, and yet it looks so, so stylish compared to everything else on the market. It's a paper bag, and yet you pick it up and you think this is stunning. And finally, it's even being embedded in the sustainability process. This is the likes of Toast Beer. Any of you tried Toast? Yeah, someone has. It's delicious. Great product. What they're doing is they are collecting the offcuts from bakeries around the city of London, 
the bread off cuts, that is, and they're using them in the fermentation to make the bread. They're making this cyclical process so that everything can come around. It is truly sustainable. And actually, last week, on a similar vein, I met a brand gathering all the coffee granules from uh, various coffee shops around London and using those in their beauty products. Uh, they're also working with a brand that's making uh, coffee oil from the granules so that everything is being used. This is what we should see more of going forward. So food's doing a good job, clearly, and there's still room for growth, but food is doing a good job. Why is beauty winning? So I had to have a good think about this because, frankly, I was all ready for a good, well, food's going well. Why is beauty doing so much better? Why are 47% of all adults thinking about ethics when it comes to, food, to, to buying their products? We're seeing the same examples when it comes to the environment, really. This is the likes of Head and Shoulders, giant creating uh, plastic made from returned and recycled beach plastic. We see this across the examples. You've got Ecova and Method, the household cleaning brands, doing the same. So many examples of sort of sustainable beauty products. But here's the strength. They're moving beyond simply talking about the environment and understanding that the consumer has a broader understanding of ethics than they ever have before. It's just like health and well-being. We now know that being ethical means more than just being green. It means being a part of the society we live in. And it's another giant brand here, but it's done something that's so special. Fenty Beauty, after years of the industry, saying, you know, we, we've got a product for people of colour. We've got, you know, there's, you've used that, that, that one cream we have for black women. It's not OK. We've got Fenty coming along saying, sorry, that's just not enough. We want products for women of every skin tone. We need something for everyone. Now, Mintel owns up to the fact that for years, we said that's very difficult. It would be very expensive for a brand to do. I think it's too tricky. Too late. Fenty came along and made that possible. Over 50 foundations in its first launch. There is a tone. There is a skin for everyone. They have changed the level. Suddenly, it is the expectation. You cannot be an equality beauty brand anymore and not have something for everyone. And that is an amazing moment in beauty. And we see it coming through in so many of the startups taking it to the next level. We've got the likes of uh, Jekka. Jekka? Jekka? I think it's Jekka. This wonderful product has been created. It's gender neutral beauty brand. It has been picked up as part of the L'Oreal Open Innovation Program this year. This is beauty for people who might be trans, people who might be experimenting with gender, people who may not be familiar with gender. This is moving away from the makeup is for girls and not for boys. This is just saying this is a makeup range and it will support your needs. Um, Mented, this is, one, this is actually a US startup, but it's a wonderful brand. It taking the Fenty message a step further. It wanted different warmths and tones of skin within its service for women of color. It's a fantastic brand and it's huge championing of giving back financial support to uh, cultures of women who are otherwise overlooked in America. It's a really wonderful thing. And finally, Disco, Disco Dust London. <laughs> Three exclamation marks from me. Founded in 2016, this is a very, very new brand, but at a basic level, it's doing so many sustainable things. Biogradable de glitter, glitter. All of those people running around in glitter and supporting the environment. Mm, it's not great if it's not biodegradable. You are polluting the system. But this is a new, an, another option. In fact, it's done well off the fact that all these big festivals have stopped giving space to people without biodegradable glitter. And this is really, really great. But beyond that, what I love is that it's all about supporting LGBTQ plus culture. I'm sure there's a few letters I'm missing, but you know, give me a minute. They are doing so many things, supporting drag artists, supporting people who want to experiment with glitter. They've got men in their campaigns, women. They've got people just loving the use of glitter. Why is this fun? Because it's fun. Everything's got so serious. It's fun and it's supportive and it's immersive. This is taking us on an experience. It's taking us on an ethical experience. It ticks all my boxes. So what's next? I think we're going to expect to see that this message of sustainability will grow. I'm not saying that ethics can't just be about being sustainable. If you've got a sustainable brand, that's so important. It's about showing how you fit in the ecosystem of life. But what I'm urging you today is to look at your product, your service, your new offering, and see how it fits in our broader understanding of day-to-day -day life. Where can you take this next? What can you do? And how does it feed society as much as it feeds the planet? They are things that we view as equal. If we think of mental health and physical health as the same, we think of society and the environment as the same. They are a collective. And the more we think of them together, the better the results we'll create. Thank you so, so much for listening this morning. <laughs> Perfect. So I have talked for 33 minutes at you this morning. There are time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions that I can help? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like to know uh, how Mintel could help us. So you work for um, um, startups and so on. So can you just give us a very short understanding of how you could help us? So Mintel reports 
many, many, uh, Mintel publishes many, many reports each year on a variety of different topics. The topics range, as I said, from things like financial services, beauty, personal care. And I guess the core function I see today is about understanding where that data sits. If you are trying to move to the next level with your business, that data, whether it is a market size, a consumer attitude, so, you know, those percentages we showed, but it goes beyond that. It could be a market size product. You know, if you want to show that the category you're entering is growing for an investor, it's about saying, well, this category is going to grow six to eight percent over the coming five years proven by Mintel. It's about also showing what innovation is going on around you. The product reports and, in fact, the services reports will also include uh, an innovation section. Who's innovating, it's called. No, no, it's called, it's called who's innovating. And when you look at that section, it will show you the competitive landscape that you're up against. Now, it might be that it proves you don't have a competitive landscape, but using our, the GMPD data that sits in those, which is a, a tracker of all the products that have launched or, or the various services, we can help to see exactly what's going on in the market. Is it that you have a brand new uh, product that is using functional sugar claims? How many others are doing that? Is that something we've explored in our report? Do we see people are doing that more and more often? In fact, if suddenly we see that this is a growing claim, we can take it two ways of a brand in that situation. Do we join on board? Do we try and make that first move player advantage and take, it, take, take on board? Or do we sit back a little and say, well, what else are we offering? How do we build on what they're offering? That's how I think those reports are extremely useful. I also think that where you have those reports, it's good to look at your category first. Of course, if you're launching a bread product, you go straight to the packaged bread report or the uh, free from report. But it's then good to see what's happening elsewhere. Where can I take innovation from? At the British Library here, they have access to all of the UK report publications. So you can suddenly see, well, look, I'm looking at fermented products in the, in the bread and bakery report. If I can look around fermented, where else can I look at fermented? What's going on in fermented drinks? What's going on in um, fermented foods? You've got this huge obsession with fermented foods growing. I can see what's happening around my product and market. And suddenly, I can contextualize my product. That is important, because so often when we talk to startups, they are in a bit of a cocoon. You have to be to get your product off. You have to sit and concentrate on your product. But the more you do so, the more you, are, you, you concentrate on your offering, you can start to become a bit blinded to going what's around you. And I think regular touch-ins when it comes to things like uh, you know, coming to the British Library and seeing what else is on offer, what else is going on, how do I understand parts of the category that I'm tapping into, and how it taps into other categories. Because in doing that, you will understand the market at large, where your product sits in it, and therefore where it's going next. If you've got huge growth in fermentation in, in drinks, and that's your, your food product, it's good to know that. You can know that people are going to be familiarized with what's happening in drink. You're on to a winner here. Does that make some sense? One more question. I think they're worried I'm going to talk too much. No? Ah, yeah, oh, one. Okay. Thank you. Jack, thank you so much for the presentation. You're it was welcome. really good, amazing. Um, one of the questions that I want to ask is, uh, you mentioned about mental health being on the one of the major trends. Yes. What is Mintel currently researching on that area? If you can tell me a bit more. Thank I can. You. I can also find out better for you, perhaps. Um, we publish a lifestyle series. This is a series that I have uh, worked on for the last few years, where we looked at, which kind of fits in a wider understanding of health. One of the big areas we've looked at recently is uh, which areas of mental, mental health are being destigmatized? Because we had an amazing campaign from Lloyd's uh, now 18 months ago, which was big on Channel 4, and it looked at um, destigmatization. If you put labels on the head and people guess the different mental health issues that people were experiencing. What was interesting there is I think that we're doing a great job with things like depression, anxiety, and understanding how those are more widespread. But I think we have got a long way to go with certain mental health conditions that are um, still, unfortunately, suffer with lots of taboo. These might be things like schizophrenia. These might be things like um, uh, personality disorders. And I think these are areas where I'd be most interested in seeing growth. And so some of the questions in the latest Healthy Lifestyles report try to guess at that. Equally, I think we're doing a great job of awareness, but the data shows there is a gap in people searching for help. So in the latest uh, data that is yet to publish, but has just come back, on marketing to men and marketing to women, which will publish in January 2020, when I'm 30, um, this data show will talk about how people don't necessarily know where they're going to look for help. So that's been a big interest area for us. So many of the charity partners we might work with who offer such amazing services, they've done a great thing in raising awareness of mental health, it's, and that's phenomenal, but it's about what do I do next? I know that I might be struggling, but where do I go? I, I've, I've got a sense I should reach out. Where's next? So it's about giving the information, I think, would be our learning from this, for how people can move to the next step. How can I, now I know that I might be struggling, 
where do I go from here? Do I go to a, a call line, a charity? There's huge work going on here, but I think the data is showing very nicely there's a lot of room for help and growth here. So that's kind of what we've been researching recently. I'd suggest you look at the Healthy Lifestyles report, which is available. Uh, it, it's got lots of goodies that will show you exactly where that situation is at. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.